I've been chasing down a problem with my virtual PFSense firewall for probably six, six months now. And the problem has been an odd one. The firewall works fine. It works as expected in a firewall capacity, natting traffic, blocking the bad guys with PF blocker NG, acting as an IPSEC endpoint for connections between John and Brandon's places, and being my VPN endpoint for my open VPN client connections. All of that, all good. But PFSense for the channel is more than just the edge of the network, it's also our layer 3 router for all VLANs and subnets internally. This is commonly known as a router on a stick, and it's not an exotic configuration for PFSense or really any enterprise-grade firewall. That being said, I noticed inter-VLAN routing or routing between VLAN subnets wasn't nearly as fast as I would expect. So in this video, I'm going to take you along on my journey as I figure out what's going on and how to solve it, assuming I can solve it, and spoiler alert, there's hardware! All right, let's dig into the problem. I first noticed this issue when I was copying data between VMs on two different VLANs. I was moving a large amount of data and it was just taking too long to complete. And what I noticed was at their peak, they were only able to move about a gig and a half a second between each other. Considering everything on this network is at least 10 gigabit connected, something clearly wasn't right. To the network diagram! In a nutshell, this is the layer three routing diagram of our network. And as you can see, it's pretty basic overall. Currently, there are four VLANs in play here. Starting on the top left, we have the client VLAN where all of the normal PCs exist. Down below that, in the light blue box, we have the server VLAN. As you guessed it, this is where our servers are located. Things like Plex Server, Unify Controller, and whatnot live here. Moving to the top right is my DMZ VLAN for services like Nextcloud and a VM for Docker containers that serve outside connections only. Connections originating in the DMZ cannot get to any other VLAN and can only get to the internet for security purposes. And the last VLAN is for IoT devices, like all the Amazon Echoes and other smart home stuff I've got. This VLAN also cannot access any other VLANs and can only go directly to the internet behind a NAT. All right, so the first thing I needed to do was get concrete numbers on network throughput between different hosts on different VLANs. Since up until this point, the only real metric I had was suspiciously slow file copies between systems, I needed to isolate just the network traffic to make sure it was in fact the network and not something goofy with the servers in the copy process or committing data to disk. And the best way to do this is with a tool called iPerf. iPerf is a tool for actively measuring the maximum achievable bandwidth of IP networks, so says its website. But in a nutshell, it is a very powerful command line based application that tests the maximum sustained bandwidth between two systems. To run iPerf, you start the application up on a host that you want to be the server, and then start the same application on a client and target that server. Let's run that test now. On the right is a VM in the DMZ network, and this system will run iPerf as the server. And on the left is a VM that exists in my client address range, and it will run iPerf as the client to connect to that server. We'll type in the command iPerf3-s and hit enter on the server, and on the client side, iPerf3-c, and then the name of the server, and hit enter. And right away, my suspicions look to be justified. As you can see, the average throughput between these two servers ended up averaging out to 1.75 gigabits a second. Keep in mind, both of these systems are VMs running on hosts with 10 gigabit uplinks. There's no excuse to have that level of performance. So we know it's a network issue and not a storage issue or application issue with Nextcloud. I did the next thing that all truly gifted IT professionals do. I started Googling for the answer. And like all searches on the net, I had a few promising leads, but the information wasn't quite applicable to my situation or were from posts and articles as old as a decade. I found posts about how running PFSense as a VM is a terrible idea and was the fault of virtualization, which I know from personal experience is bullshit, but one should never blindly trust, you should always verify. Unfortunately, that's not so easy to do if you don't actually have a piece of hardware around to run a bare metal installation of PFSense. So I took a risk. Heading over to eBay to feed my addiction for more hardware, I started searching for PFSense just to see what sort of hardware was out there. I quickly found that there are a ton of people out there trying to sell any old piece of hardware that's capable of running PFSense as a firewall. Those systems weren't going to cut it. I figured if I'm going to do this, I want something that's at least purpose-built to be a firewall. Something with ports on the front for connections, power in the back, and oh, what's this? That's when I started hitting on all of these 1U Sophos firewall systems. There were a ton of models, and many of them had 10 gig SFP Plus ports built in. That at least told me that the hardware should be capable of running them, right? Anyway, after doing some research into different Sophos firewalls and getting super frustrated with Sophos's utter lack of details and hardware specifications on their websites, I settled on the Sophos SG330 Rev2 firewall for $440. And here it is. 
Let's do a quick once over of the external features and then we'll open it up. The SG330 Rev2 looks like a right and proper firewall and that's because it is. Starting from the left, we have a two-line, 16-column LCD display that when running Sophos' software will give you statistics like bandwidth usage, IP addresses, and so on. And it will allow you to command the firewall to shut down and do a bunch of other stuff with the buttons below it. I'm not sure this is something we'll get working with PFSense, but you know I'm going to try. Next, we have the port clusters. First off, we've got a serial COM port and two USB 3 ports, power and hard disk indicator LEDs, and what looks to be yet another COM port. This system has eight dedicated 1GB base T copper Ethernet ports, two 1GB SFP ports, and then the thing I really need, two 10 gigabit SFP Plus ports. Then on the far right, we have a blank that opens up by removing two thumb screws. I did a terrible job of lighting the inside here, but fear not, we'll open this thing up and look at its guts in a moment. Suffice to say, what you don't see in the dark here is basically an 8x PCI Express slot for add-in modules for the unit. Around the back we have a single 60mm fan, an HDMI port, another USB 3 port, a DC power connector for backup power, and your typical C13 power plug, switch, and fan for the built-in power supply. Let's get to the good stuff. Let's open this thing up and see what we're dealing with. And what we have is basically a purpose-built PC in a 1U package. The SG330 Rev2 boots off a 180GB SSD, clearly made by Intel, has 12GB, yes 12GB, of DDR4-2133 non-ECC memory, and hiding under the passive heatsink runs a 6th gen Intel i5-6500 4-core CPU running at 3.2GHz. Just a standard desktop processor, nothing more. To the left we see that 8x PCIe interface extended for the add-in module I mentioned earlier. While all of this is purpose-built for this role, in essence, it's just a small computer, should be perfect for our PFSense install. This is the first boot, and from the looks of it, there doesn't seem to be anything proprietary to the system at all. Standard AMI BIOS fully unlocked, which is great, and the system boots into Sophos UTM 9.7, for which I don't have a password. Okay, now that we've established that this thing is just a computer, and it should take an installation of PFSense, let's get to it. And then I hit a snag. Booting off the USB stick for PFSense was no issue, but when I attempted to target the SSD for installation, I hit a wall with the error operation cancelled pre-check failed any time I attempted to write to the SSD. I suspect the problem is related to some sort of write protection or encryption that Sophos puts on the drive to protect their software, and nothing I did could get around it. So... I pulled the disk and replaced it with an old 240GB Intel SSD I had laying around. That was an easy enough process, save for the fact that Sophos caulked the combined SATA data and power connector to the original drive, which required some simple surgery with a razor to free. Anyway, once that replacement SSD was secured in the unit, I tried again. This time with much better results. PFSense installed without issue after replacing the drive, and it was time to get my config moved over, get the system in the rack, and cabled and tested. I'm going to spare you the how-to on this, but suffice to say the process of migrating is pretty darn simple with PFSense. I just exported my configuration from the existing VM and imported it into the new physical box. Alright, the moment of truth. Let's run that same i 3 test again, same VMs as before between two different VLANs through the new hardware PFSense host, and let's see what we get. Fingers crossed. Alright, same as the last time. The VM acting as the iPerf server is on the right, and the VM on the left will act as the iPerf client connecting to said server. Pause for dramatic effect here, and go. That's what I'm talking about. That is so much better. By the end of the test, I averaged a shade over 4 gigabits a second across two VLANs, which was well over two times faster. That's not 10 gig, but it's clearly an improvement. I'll take it. This answers the question why my VM didn't perform as well. I think it's safe to say that the throughput of PFSense is clearly tied to the clock speed of the CPU, and that kind of makes sense. My virtual hosts are running Intel Xeon E5 2680v4 CPUs that have a respectable clock speed of 2.4 GHz, and the dedicated PFSense box has a clock speed of 3.2 GHz. Let's do a very visual test of throughput through PFSense using iPerf again, and watch the CPU performance of the box. On the top is a near real-time graph of the CPU performance of PFSense rendered in Grafana. On the bottom right is an SSH session to the same VM we've been using as our iPerf server, and on the bottom left, an SSH session open to the VM we've been using as our iPerf client. We'll start the server on the right. And then on the left, we'll start the iPerf client, this time with a runtime of 120 seconds. Now we'll start the test. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about. And go. <laughs> 
It's hard to dispute what we see here. CPU2 looks to be solely handling the traffic in this iperf test, routing packets between the two VLANs with very little interaction from the other cores. There was some increased load for the other cores on the CPU, which are likely handling other traffic and processes on the box. So based on what we see here, throughput between any VLAN through PFSense is and always will be single-threaded and CPU-bound. Now that you've gotten this far, I'm sure a certain quantity of you out there are saying, well duh, you should have a solid layer 3 switch at your core to do your inner VLAN routing. <laughs> And you would be right in that a quality layer 3 switch would likely produce line speed throughput between VLANs, but that doesn't work for our network. The reason I have a router on a stick in this case is to process network traffic using firewall rules to keep clients in their respective subnets based on their roles. Let's take a look at what I'm talking about. Back to that diagram I had up earlier of the layer 3 routing in the local network. This time we'll use the same diagram but show you the access control being applied to each VLAN and how it interacts with other VLANs on the network for security. Starting with the client VLAN, simply put, this VLAN can access any other VLAN on the network without impediment. In the case of the DMZ VLAN, this allows the clients to access DMZ systems without having to hairpin out or bounce out of the internet connection and back in through the firewall for improved performance. Next is the server VLAN. Like the client VLAN, the server VLAN is bidirectionally open to the client VLAN and unidirectionally open to the IoT VLAN and the DMZ VLAN. Now to the IoT VLAN. Clients in this VLAN can only access the internet, but the firewall does allow responses to be passed through when either the client or the server VLAN comes calling. And lastly, the DMZ VLAN. This VLAN can only communicate with the internet and responds to clients and servers from their respective VLANs, and there's no access between IoT devices and the DMZ servers in either direction. Yes, you could do this with ACLs or access control lists on a layer 3 switch, but best practice is to avoid using ACLs on a switch if you can. Firewalls are the best way to handle access control and packet inspection. Okay, so we know our constraints and we know the clock speed fixes the issue. And we have this piece of hardware that's running a mid-grade desktop class processor. So let's see if we can push this thing further. The Sophos runs an Intel i5-6500 CPU and I can't see any reason why it wouldn't run an i7-6700K. To the Ebays! Right, the Ebays are, Ebay's right here. A quick search of my favorite addiction site turns up an Intel i7-6700K 4GHz CPU for 105 bucks. And here it is in the flesh, or the silicon, whatever. I wish the seller would have put this thing in an anti-static bag, but it arrived safely nonetheless. Let's see if I can get this thing to work in the SG330 Rev2, shall we? There's nothing more to the installation than you'd expect from a standard PC motherboard when it came to dropping in the chip. The SG330 Rev2 has a standard CPU retention bracket and a basic passive heatsink which affixes with four screws. We'll just pop out the old i5-6500 and drop in the new i7-6700K. Lube it up with some thermal paste, reattach the heatsink, throw the lid on it, and cross our fingers the thing boots. All done, it's go time. Oh yeah, baby. i7 CPU upgraded Sophos SG330 Rev2 boots like a charm. Woo boy. I mean, I expected that it would work, but it's not like Sophos has an official document on hardware upgrades for their appliances. Digging into the BIOS, we can see our new chip all functional and ready to go back in the rack and cable it up. Let's do that and test again. <laughs> Okay, it's time to test again with our newly upgraded i7 badass CPU. Same tests, same hosts, let's do it. Same as before, right side is the server side, left side is the client side, hold on to your butts and go. Average throughput after chip upgrade was 4.27 gigabits a second versus pre-chip upgrade of 4.06 gigabits a second. Well, shit. It's better, sure. It's basically only 200 megabits a second faster, which is great, but for $100 for just 200 megabits a second more, I don't feel like I spent my money very well. But hey, 4.2 gigabits a second is far better than the original speed of 1.75 gigabits a second from the virtual firewall. So it's all about silver linings, people. Silver linings! There's one last thing I'm happy to report at least. Using the LCD proc package available on the firewall, I was able to get the display working on the front of the unit, so that's cool. After discovering which actual COM port the LCD display was connected to, and fumbling through all the different drivers that were there, I finally found that the MTC S16209X driver properly rendered the display readable on the front, which for me made the whole thing feel complete. 
the LCD proc package is pretty freaking cool. And being able to select and see things like the running version of PFSense, the uptime of the unit, the host name, system info, CPU load, and select network traffic on an interface, I couldn't be happier. Special thanks to our YouTube members like Maurizio Ernesto DCs for supporting us. If you enjoyed this video, consider becoming a member and check out this video here where we build John his own personal little PFSense firewall for his home lab.